Excellent. All right. Thanks, Marie. Um, this is just going to be um, really chill. I, I'm kind of treating this as if um, someone walked into my makeshift lab here in Acadia and asked what I was doing and um, kind of the typical questions that I get um, whenever I'm working in a park because um, not many, not everybody uh, knows what art conservation is um, or knows very much about the conservation programs that we have um, within the National Park Service. So I really wanted to take the time to um, explain a little bit about what we do um, at Harper's Ferry Center, uh, a little bit what I'm doing here and some other kind of extraneous uh, things. So I have a lot and I'm gonna kind of, um, hopefully not tell too many anecdotes because um, Otherwise, I'll go too fast or say too much. Um, so Harpers Ferry Center, um, hopefully most of you know that um, we're a service center of the National Park Service and we have museum conservation, um, which I'll be diving into, but um, we also have, uh, my colleagues also uh, help develop new visitor center exhibits, brochures, maps, um, anything that you would kind of need to help interpret your park. And um, the Interpretive Design Center is that beautiful building, brick building on top, and then our conservation labs are in the building that you see below, that kind of nondescript building, um, which I could make a lot, of, a lot of jokes about, but it needs to look um, kind of cookie cutter because we also house the National Park Service History Collection um, and the Harpers Ferry Center Commissioned Art Collection. So we have um, sometimes very valuable things um, housed within our building, so we kind of need to be um, inconspicuous. Uh, and I'm going to read this slide um, so that I don't mess it up, um, but the word conservation, so this is not um, conservation relating to um, the environment, it's for the care of tangible cultural materials. Um, so we're devoted to the preservation of cultural property um, for the future, to preserve it for generations to come. And those of us who do this work, we're called art conservators. Uh, and so a conservator is a highly trained professional um, who has specialized education, knowledge, training, um, and experience, and we formulate and implement um, all the activities of conservation. And we follow a code of ethics, um, kind of like doctors do, uh, kind of a, a do no harm kind of thing. Um, and that includes the use of appropriate materials and especially documentation of our work. Um, and this is all through um, our, our main professional organization called the American Institute for Conservation. And this is a different type of career from a curator, a registrar, or an archivist. Um, as a conservator, I'm part art historian. I need to know like what this object is um, and why it's important or what are the different value systems that make it important. Um, I need to be part craftsperson and be really good with my hand skills because I perform very meticulous tasks that have to be very precise. Um, and I'm also part scientist. So a lot of times I actually describe myself as a little bit more like a material scientist because I might not know the entire history of what I'm looking at, but I can break it down into its material components and figure out and know, um, okay, well, this is going to age in this way. And if I add this type of adhesive to it, or if I do this to it, it will age in that way. And they'll either be working together or against each other. So it helps guide, um, you know, what I do to that object to help um, preserve it, because I don't want to cause further harm to it. Um, we're trained usually uh, via graduate programs, and there are only four main programs in the United States, uh, and the master's degree is the terminal degree. Um, you can also learn through um, apprenticeship that's called bench trained. And um, while that was very popular um, when our field was just beginning, um, that type of training is kind of phasing out at this point as we move more towards academia. And we also specialize in different subjects. Um, paper, paintings, and objects are the three biggest umbrella terms, but obviously objects means a lot of different things. So even within objects, um, we, spe we kind of sub-specialize in a lot of different categories, but I do need to know like a little bit about a lot of things. Um, and so as Marie was saying, like I happen to, my kind of sub-specialty is natural history collections because I love dead stuff, um, be it plants or animals. 
Um, and I'm, we'll get into this stuff, um, but the one thing I really want to point out on this page is that we have the National Park Service conserve ograms, and they're very useful pamphlets that kind of go along with the National Park Service Museum Handbook. So if you're unfamiliar with those, but you have to preserve collections, um, definitely check those out online. Um, at Harpers Ferry Center, we have, there are a few of us conservators and we specialize in different things. So I'll briefly touch on my colleagues. Um, this is Allison Holcomb. She's our book and paper conservator. And here's some examples of some of her treatments. Um, sometimes when you're dealing with books, you, um, you know, the purpose of the treatment could be so that it can be a little bit more archival, like it's going to be used. People or researchers are going to come and actually handle it a little bit more. So part of her job is making it be more robust so that it can withstand that handling. Um, so um, the military records from Little Bighorn on the left, she um, disassembled that book actually, and then um, made it so that the papers were better, better to, be, uh, to be handled and, and studied. But then the book on the right, um, from Harry S. Truman, uh, that was just supposed to be, you know, that's not really being opened and read. Um, instead, it's in his library and it's to show, you know, what types of books he had on the shelf. So there are some pieces missing from the leather spine and she filled in those missing pieces um, so that it would look more cohesive and look more like it did when Truman was um, living there. And this is a really great, uh, I like this uh, example. Um, this is a certificate um, awarded to Moses Cohn. Uh, this is from Blue Ridge Parkway. And she, normally you would think, you know, we don't like, we say block everything from light because light causes damage. Uh, but sometimes we can harness the power of UV. And um, in paper conservation, um, she light bleached quote unquote, um, this paper um, very control, in a very controlled way. Um, there's, there's a lot more to it than just like putting it out in the sun. Um, but this is actually more of a superficial treatment because lightening up the paper um, makes it look more like it did when it was first produced, but it doesn't necessarily like prolong the life of it. It doesn't harm it, but, um, but it just makes it look a little bit better. So sometimes um, we just, we, we make things look, look better. And I have a couple tips for each of our specialties too. Um, for paper, for book and paper, um, I don't know if people know this, but if you have um, historic books, if you have a collection, it's best to store them uh, flat as you see on the shelf in the photo. Um, and they should um, fit snugly on your shelves, but you should still be able to move them around without handling. Um, what we're used to doing, you know, is like pulling books by the spine to pull them off and that breaks the spine over time. Uh, and she says, uh, you know, please don't ever use tape and remember that because we're going to be coming back to that later on. This is Nicole Peters. Um, she's been with us for a year. She's our new, uh, we call her new, it's been with us for a year, but she's our, um, an objects conservator who focuses on metals and mechanical objects or specifically inorganics. And inorganics are metals, ceramics, glass, um, things like that, things that were not at, at one point um, growing and living. So just an example of a treatment that she's done. Um, this is from Antietam. And um, this kind of shows like how to preserve what's important about the object. So this was a shovel that was used to bury um, deceased Confederate uh, soldiers after the Antietam battle. And so it was really important um, to the park that you could still tell that it was used um, if we made it look brand new, like it had just been manufactured, then it would take away what was important about this object. It's not that it's a shovel, it's that it's, that it's the shovel that was used to, to bury soldiers. And this is a, a medallion from Carter G. Woodson. Um, and this might be more familiar of what people are thinking of when you think of metals conservation, um, you know, doing a quick, um, kind of polish of a surface and then applying a protective coating to it. Uh, and not everybody knows that um, when you polish a metal, you're actually taking off, you're removing the, the top layer of the metal because the tarnish signals that um, that top layer of the metal has interacted with the environment, with the surrounding environment, and has actually chemically changed to become something else. So you can't um, revert it back, you can only take it off. So that's why we like to add protective coatings to metals um, to, so that it won't be as exposed um, to the environment because the more you, you know, polish something, the more likely like over time, you would no longer see this inscription anymore. It would be gone. Um, 
There's a lot more I could say about coatings, but I'm moving on. And tips from Nicole, um, always wear gloves when you're handling um, historic metals uh, or your metals in general. Just, just always wear gloves, wear nitrile gloves or rubber gloves because they protect the metals from the oils um, in your hands that can etch into the surface that then like can only be removed by actually polishing it once again and taking off that top layer. And you see this really great example with a brass bed post and the image on the right and what's circled are fingerprints that are etched into the metal. So you can't wipe them off. And in fact, this is after Nicole has already gone through and treated and removed a little bit of that top brass surface, but she didn't wanna go in and, you know, remove them completely because then if she did, it would be really super shiny in those areas and you would see them and just a mess. So she had to kind of just, you know, do a, a small amount of removal throughout the whole bed frame. You still see a little bit of the fingerprints, but at least it looks more cohesive. And then she can apply a protective coating over top of that. We have a textile conservator, Ann Ennis. And um, textiles actually encompass a lot of different things. It can be uniforms and clothing, uh, upholstery on furniture, flags, uh, carpets, curtains, um, things like that. So uh, it's always interesting visiting her lab. And um, I think she's had some really um, fascinating stories as well of like, what do you preserve when you preserve these collections? This is a kepi that I think is from Gettysburg. And when you look at it here, you say, oh yeah, it looks like it's pretty torn up, pretty beat up. Oh, so you're probably gonna repair that, right? Because you don't want, you know, there's like pieces falling off of it and, and the threads are unraveling from the wool. Um, but actually, no, um, what happened to this kepi is that a bullet grazed through it. Um, and so the park really wanted her to maintain that hole that's inside that, that you see there and maintain that damage but without having it become worse over time. So she had to kind of secure all of the, um, the threads around that area of damage um, and kind of put things back together so they wouldn't fall off or we wouldn't lose them, but it still maintains that look of being in battle. And I, this is where I admit that um, I, I lured you here under false advertising. Um, I don't have a picture of Lincoln's death chair, but Anne has worked on it. So it was the chair that he was sitting in when he was shot. Um, but what I do have to show you here on this slide um, is the coat that the orchestra leader was wearing that night. And he had an altercation with Booth as Booth was fleeing the scene. And according to, according to this man, which I forget his name right now, um, but the orchestra leader, um, Booth swung at him with his knife. And so there's damage on the coat that they think is from, from the knife. And this became such, you know, it was, it was a really, um, at that time, people would sell, um, sell off, you know, um, trinkets and keepsakes and stuff like that. So the tails that you see on this coat, it looks funky. They're not quite, they're uneven and um, they're not the right color. And that's because the orchestra leader would cut off pieces of his coat to sell or give to people as kind of souvenirs of this event. Um, and, but this also illustrates um, the image on the left. Um, Anne is working on a mannequin of proper support using conservation grade materials to be able to display this so that the display and exhibit doesn't actually like cause any further harm. And her tips have to do um, with housekeeping. Um, make sure that you um, upkeep. Housekeeping means cleaning your collections and your collection storage spaces and your offices. Um, that helps prevent against um, pest infestation and mold growth. And um, it helps you make sure that you're not like losing any of your objects and, and things like that. And because she's a textile person, she um, always likes to point out um, with your family heirlooms and with museum collections, if you have a textile, like a lace piece, um, that's really important to you. Don't use it as a runner on a table or on a dresser, as you see in that image on the right, uh, because that can lead to the deterioration of the textile. So don't place anything on top of it. We have Curtis Sullivan, who is our furniture conservator, but also broad, more broadly, our wooden artifacts conservator. Um, and he spends a lot of time actually in the field working on really large projects. So like moving carriages around, restoring surf boats, um, a lot of really, really fun things. 
Um, and the tip that I've learned um, from him over time is that um, any large objects that you have, especially historic vehicles, you need to make sure that you store them off of the ground. So he spends a lot of time, it seems, um, going into parks and adding in stands um, so that things can be displayed you know, off the ground because the tires can't handle that over time. Over time, the rubber degrades and it um, causes deformation and uh, it just, it's, it's not good, it's, it's hard to fix. Um, but that, that theory can also be applied to anything within your storage facility. Um, you you don't want to have things, uh, collection pieces sitting directly on the ground, because if you were to have a water event, so like a pipe bursting or a flood, um, then those objects will be affected. So you should always um, store things off the ground. We also have a registrar, and I want to mention Shay Henrion because um, if anyone is working with the park or has any questions, um, relating to storage housing, um, then Shay is a really good person to ask because um, she is the one who packs the objects for return to the park. Um, she knows how to rehouse collections, deinstall exhibits, and especially pack objects for, um, for shipment. And so um, she, she makes really, we call it sexy storage. I don't know if that's PC or not to say at work, but, um, but yeah, she, she makes these really fantastic um, storage containers to use. Uh, in storage, but then also uh, while it's while it's traveling, and you see some examples here on the slide. And before I talk about more of my work, um, I'll just hit on a couple more things. Um, services that we offer: there are collection condition surveys. Um, and as, as uh, Marie was mentioning, like we are deployed into parks and we can look at your collection as a whole, or we can focus on specific materials and help prioritize and estimate um, what kind of work needs to be done um, in the future. And here you see me looking at a box of pencil nubs. Um, and I was like, whoa, this is weird. Who saved pencils? But you know what? I was at Carl Sandburg Home National Historic Site, and he was a writer. So of course, we're going to save all of his um, pencil stubs. We do um, analytical examination to help us figure out um, exactly what, not only what materials or what objects are composed of, um, like what kind of uh, metal it is or what kind of plastic it is, but this also is very helpful to identify any hazards within collections. Um, and uh, for example, all the way on the right, that's using uh, microscopy, um, polarized light microscopy to determine whether or not there's asbestos in a substance. We do um, res disaster response and Curtis, our wooden artifacts person, um, is the one who, who now uh, does more of our disaster um, response. Um, so he's gone on several, as you can imagine, um, related to hurricane damage. But we, I've also um, been deployed to different parks to assess the damage afterwards and help them come up with a plan on um, what they should prioritize and what they should spend their money on. Um, what were the things that were affected the most from hurricanes? We do uh, mentoring and training, so not only on site at Harper's Ferry, but uh, many times we will incorporate training into uh, what we're working on. So when I was down at Carl Sandburg home, I was working with the museum tech and uh, a museum intern, teaching them basic cleaning um, of plastics, so of a very specialized collection. Uh, and so they helped me, and in two weeks we cleaned um, over 250 objects. And then finally, um, getting to what I do, um, I am an objects conservator, um, and then I specialize on the organic objects. So Nicole, our metals person, like she and I are gonna kind of complement each other. She's inorganics and I'm organics. Um, but I still have to work on a wide variety of things. And most of the time objects contain both inorganic and organic components to them. So, um, so I still, I can't just completely ignore metals. I have to you know, deal with those kinds of things. And the, for example, um, these are some recent projects that uh, I did this summer. Um, I spent half of July out at Lewis and Clark National Historic Park um, in Astoria, Oregon, and I was helping them um, rehouse their archaeological metal objects. Um, and then some of them came back to my lab and I treated them to help reduce the corrosion and stabilize them so that hopefully they won't um, 
rust completely away um, in the next few decades. And then as the image on the, on the right, and as I've already mentioned, I was down in Carl Sandburg um, working on some of their plastic objects. And these are dentures that we think were, um, were Carl's and uh, they're made of uh, some kind of plastic or resin component um, as well as metal pieces. But, um, but why I'm here today is because of the um, natural history collection support that I can offer the Park Service. Um, this is testing for pesticides on taxidermy mounts and study skins, which were often um, doused in residual pesticides. Um, not so much anymore. Um, once we became more aware of the environmental impacts and the impacts on humans, we stopped doing it so much, um, but not completely. Um, so I can use x-ray fluorescence to very quickly tell if a mount has as, um, the presence of arsenic or mercury on it. Um, I can help um, folks mitigate uh, pest infestations. And unfortunately, that's, that's uh, what I was here doing. So, um, so Acadia is the example on that one. And um, Marie and I talked uh, a few times, I corresponded about what exactly to do and how to go through uh, the freezing process. That's how we um, mitigate pest infestations. Um, I can do uh, preventive care training on exactly how to clean your natural history um, collections uh, so that they don't start to look uh, dingy or so that they don't invite pest infestations. And then also, of course, performing surveys specifically on this material. So the wolf skulls that you see in the image on the right, um, those are from the first wolf pack that was reintroduced into Yellowstone. So pretty cool. Uh, I've done, I can also do full on conservation treatments on um, natural history collections. And usually this is taxidermy. Um, taxidermy is meant to represent a specific species. And so uh, you don't want it to deteriorate over time because it's a teaching tool. You want it to look as it did when that specimen was alive. So um, the images on the bottom, that's a golden eagle taxidermy mount from Bryce Canyon. And the top layer of um, one of the toes was eaten by um, an odd beetles. And so I reconstructed it and kind of rebuilt up the surface and then painted it to blend in um, with the surrounding uh, materials. And that was all using conservation grade materials. Um, and this is not a uh, piece of taxidermy. However, these skills can also translate into um, many other different types of objects. Um, this is a sharpshooter knapsack from Gettysburg uh, that is constructed out of calf skins. So, you know, that there's some hair. I, I was very excited for this um, hairy object. Uh, but as you can tell in the before treatment images, all of those lighter areas, um, especially in the top image on the right, you can see the, the really bright creamy areas um, around the orange hair, that's all pest damage. So that's where black carpet beetles had gone through and eaten away a little bit of the skin. Um, so like the base of the hair and the top of the skin and the larva of the carpet beetles, they were just munching and munching and it created all this hair loss on the knapsack. And this knapsack, um, is very unusual. Um, they think that there's only about five that still exist in the world. Um, it's Prussian style. And um, just the fact that there were sharp shooters in the Civil War, like I didn't know that before this project because um, I didn't think that our aim was that good, but apparently there were. And so this is a really special object um, for people who, um, who know um, much of Civil War history. So the curator at Gettysburg, he really likes um, his collection to be more representative of how it would have looked at that time, um, 150 years ago. And especially for this exhibit, it was specifically on the life of soldiers at that time. And so he, you know, a soldier uh, wouldn't have, like the knapsack wouldn't have looked like this. Um, the pest damage and the loss of some of the leather trimmings and the breaks in the leather, that all occurred much later in the life of the object, a kind of after it became more of a museum object. So I'm not erasing the value of the of this knapsack by performing conservation treatment. Um, I'm just you know making it uh, look a little bit more um, as it did uh, when it was used. And to achieve this, I got to do some hair plugs. So that's where that part of the title comes into play. Um, and uh, this is something that we do in taxidermy mounts as well. Uh, and I purchased um, five different uh, species or yeah, five different types of hides um, that are all you know, commercially available. It's always um, domesticated animals that we're allowed to eat. So there are a lot of skins that are available on the market. So it's two different goats, two different cows and um, some bison. 
And um, it involves taking tweezers and um, clumping up just a little grouping of hairs, trimming them off at the bottom, and then placing them onto the container um, exactly where you want them to go using um, our conservation grade adhesive and then a little bit of heat to tack it down. So this is where those hand skills come into play. And also, uh, if you find joy out of doing repetitive tasks, which I do, I find it very meditative, um, but not everybody does. And that's okay. It's job security for me. So my tips um, would be, um, since leather is, is um, one of my favorite things, um, don't use leather dressings or saddle soaps or things like that. If you, if you have actual horse tack that you are actively using, awesome, go for it. Or like your leather boots that you want to condition at home, cool. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. But if it's a museum object, if it now is under our care, it no longer needs to be pliable. Like you don't have to use it in the same way. And so it's not good to add those dressings because what they're doing is they're adding in oils and literally fat, um, meat's foot oil that's literally from, from feet, um, from hooves of animals. You're introducing that and you're driving it down into the leather and it doesn't actually clean it and it only makes it pliable for a short amount of time. And then over time, those oils and fats break down and oxidize and they cause um, structural damage um, on like a microscopic level. And they also cause this thing called fatty acid spew. And it's what you see in the top image um, and that white haze that's all over that green jacket that was formerly owned by a ranger from Yellowstone. Um, that's all that fatty uh, substance coming up. And there's nothing that we can do to um, remove it completely. All we can do is wipe the top surface, which is fairly easy. However, um, it's not good if the, if the actual leather is not in good condition. It can't withstand you know, repeated wipings um, year after year. So it's just better not to use oil dressings or leather dressings. And then also um, don't use mothballs. Um, if anyone is using those at home, um, don't do it anymore. They are a known carcinogenic. Uh, and so um, you know, we, we deploy instead the principles of integrated pest management. Um, to be able to handle um, or to uh, prevent pest infestations um, right from the beginning. So uh, this is something that is employed by um, farms and uh, you know farmers on a grand scale, like like especially organic farmers. You know you're you're not using insecticides, um, and it relies on um, inspection and monitoring so that you know what's going on in your collection and that if something happens, then you can very quickly take care of it. And, um, and you can uh, mitigate the risks by performing exclusion practices, which means making sure that your door sweep is um, functioning, uh, making sure that all of the cracks and crevices um, in your storage area are sealed, um, making sure things are clean, making sure that there's, um, there aren't any leaking pipes or there's no food because pests really love um, dark places where they have water, food, and um, they're undisturbed so that they can, they can mate and just kind of like live their best lives. Um, and we wanna take that away from them. And what you see on the, uh, on the left are sticky traps that we use um, to see, you know, they're just called blunder sticky traps because anything that blunders along and you check those um, at different intervals, usually it's once a month and you see, okay, good. I don't have, you know, that I don't have a cigarette beetle on there. I'm, I'm looking good. Um, but even if you don't have, um, you know, heritage eaters or museum pests, the types that will eat your collections, you might have other types of animals on there. Um, that then will attract the insects that will eat your collection. And that's what you see happening at the image on the right. That's a house centipede, kind of ubiquitous. Well, it's ubiquitous where I am. I'm assuming it's ubiquitous here. Um, they're attracted to moisture and they're also predators. So anytime that you have any other kind of insects in your, um, in your space and you have something, um, some moisture, you're gonna see these. And this was on a trap. And then what I've circled in red, those are um, dermestid beetles that eat prote proteinaceous materials. So they're feasting on this house centipede saying, thank you very much. Uh, but then in, when they're done eating that, then they can go and infest um, our museum collection and all of the taxidermy and other proteinaceous materials. And that's what led me to here. Uh, so, um, as I'm assuming most folks know, um, and as Marie touched on, um, there was a cigarette beetle um, outbreak uh, in the herbarium. Um, and 
by the way, uh, I've asked many people and um, uh, across the world, and some people pronounce herbarium with the H and some without the H, and I've just decided to do with the H. So in case you're wondering, um, that's why I say that. But um, yes, so the, um, they noticed that there was an outbreak. Um, and so Marie did a really great job. And over the course of two years, isolated the collection and followed the proper pre freezing protocols to freeze everything and kill off um, the cigarette beetles. Uh, and then now I'm here to systematically go through the collection and clear away any of the pest infestation damage, examine them, see the extent of damage, and perform other repairs as needed. And the cigarette beetles um, eat uh, plant materials or cellulosic materials. So that's why, you know, they were, they were often seen, um, they eat tobacco. So that, that's part of why they were so named cigarette beetles, but they also eat grains and any kind of food thing. So um, they might be the type of beetle that you find if you leave a bag of flour in your pantry for a long time and you come back, you open it up and you're like, oh, what's this in here? Like that could be this type of um, beetle. There are also drugstore beetles that look very similar. Um, they're just small brown beetles and even though this image is huge, so you can see a little bit better what it looks like, actual size, um, they're smaller than a grain of rice. And if anyone is um, on site um, at headquarters, I saved a few of the beetles that I found uh, while I was working and you can see how small they are. I don't even think like that, that dot right there is one, if you can see it, I don't know, yeah. Um, so, since you can't really see, like here, here we see as well, um, these aren't even adults. So the adult beetles aren't the ones that are causing the harm. It's always the larva. It's always those pesky, you know, teenagers always like eating you out of house and home. They're also eating your collections. Um, so here we see two different ones. Um, I'm not even 100% sure that these are the cast larva skins of, car of the cigarette beetles. They might be a different type of beetle. Um, but I wasn't able to find any examples to really know for sure. But when the larva um, turns into an adult, they cast their, um, their skins. And so we see those as evidence that there was a larva there at some point. So you can see how the small they are compared to the rest of the um, plant specimen on the page. And then I can also tell um, that an, a, an insect has been there uh, because when I look at when I look at the sheets as a whole when I'm examining them, there's just a lot of like detritus and there's a lot of stuff going on and it looks kind of dirty and messy and there's a lot of little pieces. So this is one where um, you, you I look closer at it and I could tell that um, not only did I have um, some loss on the flower from uh, from munching on it. Something was munching on it. It was it was having a little feast. But then also, of course, uh, when you eat, you also got to poop. And um, and so the insect. There's also a lot of frass. That's what we call. It's a polite term. We call it frass um, when it's when it's insects. Um, and maybe well, I guess for rodents we call it droppings. Um, so I was like, aha, I see that here. Um, and same with this, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, you can't outsmart me insects. I can see here too on this leaf uh, on the left, you see that there's, there's loss on the leaf and the part that was eaten by an insect is the part that has the uneven edges all around it. And the more I looked at these specimens too, it was very interesting because some of the plant specimens had insect holes in them from when they were living. And I knew that it was because when the plant was alive, because the edges would have been kind of brown because then when the plant was, you know, that edge kind of died while the rest of the plant was still alive. But I know that this is damage from a pest infestation after it was mounted because, um, because there isn't, you know, a difference in color on those, those munched edges. Um, and it's not just loss from the leaf becoming brittle because that kind of loss is much more like sharp lines and edges and things like that. Um, and then also on the image on the right, you can see where um, it would just like ate a chunk down. Uh, it's like just, it's three-dimensionally different now on, on the stem of that. And you can see all that frass and debris that's just kind of spread all around. And uh, also looking at the, so all the specimens are stored in folders to help keep them together and um, of the of similar type. And, um, and so when I would be looking along the crease of the folders, I could see these brown dots, the, the frass, or sometimes it's frass, but I think sometimes it's just kind of like 
plant debris and stuff like that. And that would give me an indication of, oh, I should really pay attention in this one because there might be a few pages or at least one, one good page um, that has some pest damage in it. Well, before I move on, I also wanna say the reason why it's important for me to come in here and clean off, I'm, I'm using a really soft bristle brush, I'm cleaning all this evidence away, is because part of the future inspection and monitoring for integrated pest management is knowing when something is new pest evidence. So if I didn't clean this and someone opened this up in the future, they would go, oh, oh no, oh my gosh, um, I see some larva skins here and I see some frass and stuff. We need to stop what we're doing and immediately freeze everything because I think we have an infestation. Um, so I don't, I don't want that to happen. Um, if I clean away all the old stuff, then that means from here on out, if people open something and they see something, then they know that it's going to be an issue. And that's common practice with integrated pest management. So it wasn't just, um, I wasn't just looking for that. I was also looking to see how materials were holding up over time. And I got some really great examples of when people use. Um, not so good materials, certainly not conservation grade materials. Um, and what I mean by conservation grade is materials that have been tested and proven over time to age well. So it does not mean that they will never age in their entire lives, like 500 years from now, they'll look the same. No, it doesn't really mean that, but it just means they age much more slowly than other materials. So this pressure sensitive tape that we see, probably one of the first iterations of tape as we know it, um, we can see that that has yellowed very quickly um, and it's no longer um, holding up in the image on the on the right on the top. Um, that piece has lost all of its all of its stickiness and I just very gently can pry it up and then take it off. And uh, this one was mounted in 1934. So when tape first came out, people were like, whoa, this material, it's so cool. It works so great. Like, look, it's clear. And then it did not hold up um, the test of time. And um, so if you have anything important at home, even if it's modern day tape, uh, it's still not going to age well because it's based on plastic and it's based on different types of like funky adhesives. Um, so don't use tape on your uh, family heirlooms. If it's something that doesn't really matter to you, awesome, go for it. Um, and you can see at a certain point, um, someone in this collection recognized that uh, that the tape was failing. And on the bottom image on the on the right, you can see where they added in a better kind of like linen based tape, I imagine with a water based adhesive on it, kind of like a stamp. Um, that's that's better material that they replaced because the, the tape fell off. Um, there were also, uh, I could see over time, um, people got really jazzed on different kind of plastic bags. Um, so very common in herbarium collections, um, any kind of little fragments that come off, you put them in plastic bags so that people can, um, can take them as samples or uh, just, it's just better than kind of like gluing things back on because you don't really know where they go sometimes. Um, but the, like different decades of these herbarium sheets, I could see different types of plastic bags that were used and um, most of them were failing. So the one on the left, um, it had completely come open. So all those little pieces on the inside um, could have been lost through handling and like once it gets disassociated with that exact specimen, it doesn't have any scientific value. So you need things to stay together. And the plastic on the right, that one was just completely shredding and coming apart. Um, so the, the, um, the fragments on the inside could come out and it also had detached from the page itself. So just really bad. And then, oh, here's more tape. Um, so sometimes people will do things and they're like, oh, it's just temporary, it'll be fine. And I kind of imagine that Benefit of a doubt, maybe someone thought that this masking tape would be really good to put on here um, before they got around to actually pasting it down with using a glue. Um, and I think this, this may have been in 2003, and you can already see on the image on the left, I can see where the tape is starting to stain the, um, the card with the important information on it. Um, you might not be able to tell in the image so much, but on the image on the on the right, you can really see where it has stained the paper. And so I removed, anytime I saw masking tape, I removed that because um, it stains it. And then eventually um, the adhesive fails and then this piece would have fallen off. And then once again, we would lose that important scientific data. And then this, this specimen would become useless, unfortunately. 
Um, on the on the left, anybody know what that is? Um, what I've circled, um, that's rust and an impression from a paper clip. So um, I removed that immediately. I was like, this is out of here. Um, and paper clips um, can can rust around um, around images and um, or uh, around important information. So it might be like okay for just a little tiny while, but if you keep it on there, um, you risk uh, damaging important things. So don't use paper clips. Um, and then the image on the right, um, that's just some really funky adhesive that they use that's like super shiny, turning different colors, not even working. There's some masking tape on there. So that one was a little bit of, of a mess. Um, so what I was doing uh, was going through and using a very soft bristle brush. Um, actually, I'm gonna show this first. A soft bristle brush to remove any of the frass and the detached pieces of plant material to, to remove the um, evidence of pests. Um, and then I was going through and making my own packets. So discarding the plastic packets and making my own out of archival paper. And then also I was pasting them on using a, a conservation grade um, adhesive known as Jade R. It's a PVA emulsion. So it's basically Elmer's glue, but much, much better. It doesn't have the same kind of additive um, ingredients that Elmer's glue does. It's a much purer uh, adhesive. So I was using that um, to paste on my fragment container um, and then uh, labeling it because you can never, just in case in the future, like 70 years from now, my adhesive does fail. Um, then at least the packet has the number on it so that we know exactly what it is and the fragments don't become useless. And then as part of my um, procedure, also taking an image of it afterwards that uh, Marie can then have as um, part of digitization of her collection. And a note that um, I was able to, uh, I treated, um, so I, I either, anytime I, I actually like touched the specimen and, and made some kind of changes to it, we considered that a treatment. Um, and so I would, you know, do what I needed to do and then take a photograph of it. So I treated um, around 150 specimens. Um, not all of them had uh, pest damage. Um, a lot of them had um, just pieces that were coming off or needed to be tacked back down. Um, I examined or inspected over 25 boxes and the boxes you can see in the cabinets um, and also like an open box on the image on the right. Um, and we estimate, um, I don't know how many actual sheets um, with specimens on, but we estimate that it was over 1000 um, sheets. So, uh, so we managed to get through a lot in, um, in just a week and a half, um, which is really great because you never know when you have an infestation, what it's really going to look like in every single box. And I could have opened more of them. They could have been, you know, completely atrocious. Um, but we lucked out that the pest damage wasn't as bad as we originally thought it was going to be. So that's really great. Um, and I just have like a couple, um, you know, to save time for questions, um, Marie wanted to, um, wanted me to talk a little bit. Oh, here's our, let me make a plug for our, um, our Instagram page. Um, we're conservation underscore HFC underscore NPS. So if anyone's on, um, Instagram for that, and here's our contact information, but, um, I'm, I'm sure you all know how to, how to find us on, um, NPS, but, um, I do have a couple slides or information if anyone's curious. Um, Marie kind of, uh, some, some folks know me from a project that I did at the American Museum of Natural History um, where I worked for a few years before I entered the park service. Uh, and we, I um, helped research dyes used in recoloring faded taxidermy. Um, and so that was a project that ended up, um, the impetus was the renovation of the Hall of North American Mammals um, in that museum. And uh, so that project is um, the renovation as well as the subsequent recoloring of uh, or research project was featured um, on Science Friday. Um, I was interviewed by Oprah Magazine for a really, really brief column um, as well as um, Senator, oh, I forget his name right now, but a, a radio show on Sirius XM. So that um, I, some, some folks kind of uh, know about that. So if anyone has any more questions about that, feel free to ask. Um, but that's it. And so now we can now we can open it to any questions. Thanks a bunch, Fran. Really super appreciate it. That was awesome. A lot of information. And uh, thank you for really helping out our collections. That was great. Um, 
And uh, so Rebecca has asked one question and folks can, after this, folks can unmute and go ahead and ask questions. But uh, Rebecca was just asking about what, whose Jeep was that in the photo? Yeah. Um, anyhow, yep. Yeah, that one, um, that was from Carl Sandberg. Um, and it was a Willys Jeep and it was in pretty good condition. Um, at some point, um, the, the park told me that it had been conserved, but I suspect that it was more um, restored maybe because they said they, they thought that the, all the oils had been removed um, from like the engine and whatnot. Because when, when you prepare vehicles to be on long-term storage and no longer be used, you want to remove all of the fluids so that they don't leak kind of in perpetuity. Um, but in fact, yeah, like they had not been removed. So the park was dealing with some leaks as well. Um, so that was a little bit un unfortunate, but, um, but yeah, there's that Jeep. And then um, Curtis has also uh, moved some Jeep and Jeeps and prepared some vehicles um, at Joshua Tree at a, a ranch down there. So uh, I didn't know that much about Jeeps until um, he started telling me about them, but pretty cool. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. And any other questions that folks have? Oh, there you go. Marie, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? I just oh, heard her go. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, my muting is weird. I just was, I mean, I know that we've been working for the past week and a half, but um, I was just impressed with all the different things that you've worked on. Has there ever been something that you could not fix or that you just felt like this is just not going to work? Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely have. And I, I feel like there are like with, within each specialty, there are probably certain examples that people can always think of. Um, a lot of times it's, it's when an object has something called inherent vice. And that means that there's something about it intrinsically that will just continue to deteriorate. And there's not much we can do for it except try to like slow the process. Um, so an example of that would be red rot on books. So if people, some certain vegetable tanned leathers, especially during a certain time period, manufactured during a certain time period, um, go through a chemical reaction with, we think, sulfur from the air, and they just, it just breaks down. And so if you have an old book at home and you, you touch it, you handle it, and then you see like red stuff in your hand afterwards, that's the red rot. And um, there's nothing we can do for it. It's just going to keep happening. So we just try to manage it and then like do the best we can. Um, in my personal experience, when I encountered this the most is when it's taxidermy specimens that have not been mounted properly. And this skin is literally like just shattering or oozing off of them or some really gross stuff like that, where it's like the, the integrity of the cellular, of the um, collagen fibers of that skin no longer exist and it's just going to break down forever. Great. And then Karen, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Sorry, it took me a minute. I was thinking about teams and the buttons in a different place. Um, if um, I just wondered if someone wanted to find a conservator to work on a, a family object and how would you suggest they go about finding one? Yes, uh, that makes me really happy to hear. Um, so first, you could um, you could email me because I didn't have uh, I didn't have this on the slide, but um, but as part of the American Institute for Conservation or AIC, our professional organization, when you go to that website, one of the first things that pops up is find a professional, and it's kind of like it's a find a conservator tool, and you can put in um, the types of objects that you want uh, worked on and even a geographic area, and it'll show you the conservators in that area who work on that specialty. Um, but, but since you know me too, you can also ask me and I can help because sometimes, um, sometimes that search tool um, isn't as good as or thorough as we would like it to be. But, um, but yeah, but great question because there are a lot of people out there who work on family heirlooms. Awesome, and Rebecca, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask yours? Sure, um, uh, Fran, would you just speak very briefly about the policy and, and where we are with taking samples and destructive analyses? What, what's the, we oftentimes, I oftentimes get asked, can I have a little bit of something to do DNA? And what's the, how do we, how do, we do that? Or can we do that or should we do that? 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that is quite, um, we could probably have like a whole nother talk on that. And I'm involved with a group um, that specifically, it's like a bunch of um, conservation scientists and conservators and other folks who, who have biological material in their collections and talking about this type of thing. Um, because yeah, like when you're when you're sampling for DNA or just trying to do other types of analysis on things, like try to figure out exactly what animal a skin came from, um, that is usually destructive analysis. And um, we try to use certain analytical things um, that's non-destructive, and that's what you saw me using the X-ray fluorescence or the X-ray gun. That's something that you can just put on an object and and analyze it. But that doesn't always work. Um, and there are many situations in which that doesn't work. Um, and so what we try to do from a conservation, um, from a conservator point of view, we try to see, like, figure out, um, first of all, yeah, you have a conversation with the different stakeholders of that collection. So the curators, um, or if there's no curator, you know, who are the people who this collection means something to? And sometimes that's actually local communities. So it might be indigenous communities if what you're working on is an indigenous piece, uh, a indigenous object. Um, and you ask everyone if they're okay with it. Um, so it's like, is the research question so important that you can take um, a small amount of this sample that you'll never get back? Um, and sometimes that's yes. And so then it's okay, now from here, um, what is the technique that will tell us what we wanna know? Are there any techniques that are non-destructive? Now, okay, this one's destructive, but are there any techniques, like what is the smallest amount um, that we are allowed to take um, to be able to achieve what our research question is? Uh, and I think sometimes when people think of sampling, they think of taking really big uh, pieces and maybe what, uh, what to a lay person, you're like, oh yeah, you just like nab a little, but actually what conservation scientists can use is like tease out a really small, like one fiber from something. And that might be enough to be able to like do what you need to do. And I can think of lots of examples for that, but I did notice on some of the specimens um, on the pages, it would say that it had been um, tested. And on one sample, I like most of the time I couldn't see where they had taken that, but on one, it looked like there had been a hole punch through um, one of the leaves. So that seemed like an egregious amount of original material to me, but, um, but I don't really know what they're working on. But it's definitely something where you need to have a conversation uh, with, with many different voices um, in the room to be able to figure out if you really do wanna do that. Because um, what's the point of having something in your collection if you're just gonna um, use it all, you know? I hope that like at least sheds light on, on um, what the topic is. Hopefully that's um, an okay example or okay answer. No, that, that was a great answer. And yeah, it's always a trick to figure out how to, how to you know, one of the reasons we want to keep the collections is to be able to learn from them. And, um, but yeah, no, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Any, maybe time for one more question. Anybody has the last question they want to ask? No? All right. Well, with that, I'll just thank you very much, Fran. That was perfect on time. That was great content. I think it was um, it was super. Um, I think a lot of us are interested in what happens in the collections and just don't necessarily know a lot about it. And uh, and so that was awesome. So thank you very much. And um, and thanks for sharing your contact also for how to follow up with you. And, yeah. Yeah. Seriously. And let me just make one more plug for that. You know, if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, I don't know any art conservators. Well, you do now, you know me and, uh, and you know, it's part of my job to help. And so even if it is a personal family heirloom question, you know, shoot it my way and, um, and we'll see how we can help you out. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. And again, this will be posted on the Scudic Institute YouTube page uh, later on, probably within a week or so. And, uh, but yeah, thanks a bunch, Fran. Cool, yeah, thanks. Bye y'all. <laughs>